All right, you guys ready to get started and see what Paul has to say to us today out of Philippians? You know, Philippians is a joy book, and I know I've said that to you every time. But by the way, if you've read the book of Philippians, you've seen it 17 times in, in one book in four chapters. Now, seriously. So this is why it's really easy for somebody like me to tell you this is the joy book because 17 different times in four chapters, Paul talks about joy or rejoice, something that denotes the fact that we're to be rejoicing. And, um, and, and so this book's full of it, and, and today we find ourselves right in the middle of, a, a, to me, a tremendous little section of Scripture, these first eight verses of the fourth chapter, through my life. And I know you guys, you know, you know I've been in the ministry a long time and so forth. And, and when I was very young, um, one of the passages that I did, I preached quite often when I preached at other places, you know, besides the church that I pastored, I was pastoring when I was 18 years old and ordained and everything. And of course, I was really young and was used by lots of churches uh, in the vicinities of where I was to speak to their young people and to do things for youth and so forth. Because quite frankly, that's the only people that really cared what I had to say about anything, you know. I mean, who has an 18-year-old pastor? I mean, you know, not only does he not know anything, he doesn't even suspect anything. I mean, you know, it's right, not dry behind the ears at all. And, uh, but uh, thank the Lord, he was so graceful and put me with people that just love me in spite of that. And most of those people that I pastored when I was 18 or 19 have gone on to be with the Lord. They were so, uh, you know, helpful in my lives and, and all of that. But I would preach, and this was one of, this passage right here is one of the passages that I love to preach about because it, um, it has such great insight about something that we all need. Uh, I'll just go ahead and quote the verse, and I wrote it in your notes for you in the opening paragraph. I used to uh, use quite often and quote quite often and heard others quote quite often the seventh verse of the fourth chapter of Philippians, and it says, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So at, when I would go to a funeral home, as an example, and someone had lost somebody that they loved, one of, my, one of the things that I would use to try to comfort them was, hey, listen, I know it's a terrible thing, but the peace of God will, 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 that, that will pass your ability to understand it will, will strengthen you inside, and God will give you strength and courage or in crisis events, or when things were, you know, anxious and a lot of anxiety flying around. This is one of the verses that I would use, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And until, I used to use that a lot like that, until I actually read the chapter that that verse came from. And it still means the same thing. It still means that God has a peace that will blow your mind. It passes what you can understand. You don't understand how you can make it through some things. You don't understand how it's going to work, that you're always going to be sad, that it's going to be, you're just going to always feel terrible. No, 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 because God is going to do something on the inside of you that you can't even comprehend. If somebody tried to explain it to you, you know, yeah, I know, I know lots of times we all say, man, I wish I knew what God was doing this for, or I wish I knew God's purpose for this when we're in these really terrible things or crisis things or hard things or things that don't, that just don't work like we think they ought to work. But my word to you is, if he explained it to you, you probably wouldn't understand anyway. You know, I'm serious. God, please, you're just begging God for an explanation. And God's saying, brother, I'm sorry, but if I even tried to tell you, you wouldn't understand anyway. It would just be more confusing to you. But this verse says that God has a peace that's like that. Now, that sounds very inviting to me, actually, because I'm saying, you know, now I'm a little older than 18, and I... <laughs> <laughs> and I, Mike, Mike and I were talking about that, you know, just a few minutes ago. Yeah, I'm a little bit older. Tanya just seems to not have aged, but I, I happen to, uh, to be a lot older than that now. And, and I always thought that the older you get in the Lord, the easier life was going to get. 
Did any of you make that same mistake? <laughs> yeah, you thought, okay, by the time I get to be 40, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm 20 years old now. Yeah, I'm 20 now. By the time I get to be 40, then I'm going to have conquered this anxiety issue, uh, this sinfulness in my life, this carnality, you know, I mean, man, surely by the time I get to be 40, this will be really easy for me and I'll be a great Christian and, you know, uh, all honey and no bees, you know, all, <laughs> no work and all ease. I, I'm going to have a great life, you know. And, uh, and I said that until I got to be 40. And then when I got 40, I looked at those that were 50, and I said, surely, by the time I get old, like 50, you know, I'll have this thing mastered in life. And, and, and to make a long issue short, I kept saying that until it finally came to the conclusion that life doesn't get easier. As a matter of fact, it really gets harder, uh, and I hate to even say that to you because some of you that are young now are probably going, oh, my Lord, no, yeah. Don't get scared. You've got a God. That's why you need Jesus. Not because you're going to die right now, but because you're going to live uh, some more, you know. That's, why, that's really why you need Jesus, because you're going to wake up tomorrow and be in this same old crazy world. So you really need him for that. And, uh, but but uh, as you get older, the issues get tougher. I mean, that's just what it boils down to. I mean, when I was 18 years old, I'm worried about pimples. You know, now I'm worried about, I'm worried about tumors, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, I mean you know, it does, it does matter, you know, <laughs> how these things come across, you know, really. And so life just carries its own weight as it goes through. And so Paul is telling us in this fourth chapter that we can have a peace that, will, that's, that is beyond our ability to understand it that's going to strengthen us throughout whatever area of life we're in. Whether it's a young teenage disturbance or whether it's like an old man's real worry about something. You know, I mean, what, what, no matter where we are, Christ has a, a strength that comes inside of us that will give us the ability to be at peace in our life, no matter what. And I'm thinking, is that really possible? You know, is really, really, is that possible for us to have that kind of peace and live that kind of life? Because, you know, some people never live life like that. Their whole life is, you know, they don't enjoy life. Paul says in the fourth verse, and we'll read it in just a minute. Paul says in the fourth verse of this chapter, rejoice in the Lord always. Yeah. And just in case you missed it, uh, and again I say rejoice. Yeah. And I'm thinking, is that even possible? Can you live a life where you could be joyful at all times, no matter what? And I think about the lives that we live, and I see how people, lots of, many people, they don't, they don't enjoy life. They endure life. Their life is an endurance contest. They have pressures. They have anxieties. They have stress. And their whole life is just one continuous struggle after another after another. Can somebody like that really obey God when he says rejoice? which is basically like revival, you know. If you know what a revival is, is you had vibed at one time, and now you've lost it, and now you need to revive. Rejoice is pretty much the same thing. You joiced at one time, but you've lost your joy. Now you need to rejoy, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. Always. And, 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 and again, I say rejoice, and so I think, okay, so we've got to learn how to enjoy life, not just endure life. Because life is going to be filled with these struggles. I'm telling you, they are. And I'm, I mean, I live, you know, on Honeycomb Lane and uh, Cotton Candy Drive down there. And, you know, my house, because I'm a holy man of God who, who has honey flowing out of his mouth, you know, and fire from his eyes. And he's got the anointing of God all over him. You know, I know I don't face the struggles y'all face, but, but, but I'm just telling you, I've seen people face these struggles. <laughs> I look out my window and see people struggling like this. But yeah, 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 life is this way. And so this is a good word for us. This is a good, 
it's a good, good word for all of us at this point in our lives, at any point in our lives, because we all struggle with this. And how in the world could we do that? Well, let me just, let me read some verses for you. It's always helpful when you're preaching to read some verses. So let's read some verses, all right? Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, boy, that's a good sound. Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and my crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Uh-oh, I implore you, Odia, and I implore Seneca to be of the same mind in the Lord. Uh-oh, two ladies in the church evidently are on the odds with each other. Oh, okay. Now, I've been, you know, I've been very courageous in preaching most of my life, but I've never been courageous enough to call a couple of ladies that are having a spat in the church out, out by name in a, sub, in, a, in a worship service, you know. But here's Paul saying, and I don't know who you, Odia, and Seneca are. I mean, there's, you could guess. But, but they're just basically, they're two women in the church at Philippi. Just like, you know, let's say, you know, let's get, let's get, let's get, let's get Pat and Tanya to quit fussing in church. Yeah. <laughs> Let them be, hey, he, Paul says, all right, be of the same mind. Uh-huh. Come on, ladies, get on the same page. We're on the same, we're in the same army. We're in the same family. We, we're fighting the same enemy. You like, come on, man, you quit fighting each other and get on the same side. All right, now just kind of pay attention to these verses because I'm telling you it'll matter in just a second. I implore you, Odia, and I implore Seneca to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, uh, help these women who labored with me in the gospel and with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. I love that book of life, right? So you see what he's doing. He's giving them instructions. He's saying, okay, do this, and I want you to do this. And All right, and then verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men, for the Lord is at hand. That word gentleness really explains itself, right? I mean, the word when you say gentleness, it just sounds gentle, you know. I mean, let your uh, graciousness, your, your, your kindness, your... your uh, your ability to be soothing, your ability to not fly off the handle, your ability to handle issues without blowing up and, and going to pieces. Let your gentleness, this is a testimony word. Gentleness is a testimony word. And if you don't know what gentleness is, if anybody's ever handled you with gentleness, you know what it is. Because when they walked away, you said, that's a gentle person. Yeah, yeah. Or that's a kind person. You know, you don't have to have somebody tell you they're kind, right? Or gentle. I mean, those words are just self-explanatory. When somebody does it to you, you know it. You say, man, that's a kind person. You just, they walk away. It's like a presence. It's like a spirit. It's like a spiritual aura that they have around them. They're just gentle and kind. And so he says, all right, let your gentleness be made. And then look at this. Be careful for nothing. Everybody say this. Be full of care. All right, say it with me. Be full of care for no thing. All right, let's say it all together. Be full of care for no thing. That's what that says. Be full of care for no thing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, what? Well, yeah, hey, praise the Lord. <laughs> I know, you, know, you know what that is? That's a heart saying, that's what I need. That's exactly what that is. Yeah, we all need it. And, but the point I wanted to make by sharing those verses and letting you just see, you see that verse 7 is not the first verse on this frame of thought about the peace of God. It is actually, obviously, uh, seven verses down. In other words, six verses come before this verse. Do any of you, when you're talking to someone about something important, do you ever say, do you ever just start the conversation by walking up to them and say, um, uh, uh, and also, you know, what else we need to do? I mean, that's your first line of the conversation. And what would they do if you did that? They would say, At what? What? What are, yeah, what are we talking about? And you said, and also we need to do, so what is it that we, what is it that you said before? Or what is, I mean, no, that would be, nobody out of the blue starts a sentence with and. Because and implies that something has come before that you need to know about because whatever's about to be said 
is based on what has been said before. So what I'm saying to you is when you read your scripture and you come to verses like this, you look at what it starts with, like therefore is another one of those telltale words. Therefore, you need to see what it's there for. So read the ones before and you'll find what it's there for. So therefore, or and, and, but what I'm saying is all of the six verses that come before give instruction about what's necessary so that verse 7 will be true. As an example, you know, he said, uh, this is to you, my longed for and my beloved. And then what did, he, what did he say? So stand fast in the Lord. So the first instruction for the and the peace of God will pass all understanding, will keep your heart and mind is the first thing is you, you must stand fast. What does that mean? That means quit wobbling around everywhere. That means quit being inconsistent. Quit being uh, non-dependable. I mean, get tough. Come on, we're in a battle here. You got to show up for the fight. I know it's good to say, man, I'm with you in heart and I'm with you in spirit. We got, a lot, we got several people with us in spirit. Look at these empty chairs right here. There's, some, there's one. Here's one. Somebody's in the spirit. Somebody's with us in spirit right here and somebody's in spirit with us right here and somebody's in spirit with us right here. And the only trouble is that's no good to us. Stand fast. Stand fast. Be faithful. Do your job. Show up. Give you money. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> hey, while I'm on a roll, I'm on a roll. I might as well hit all of it. Mm. That's right. That's right. And, and so stand fast. And then what does he say? He says, I beseech Euodia and I beseech Seneca that they be of the same mind. So not only do I need to be steadfast, I also, I also need to be uh, of the same mind. Yeah. In other words, I, I, I can't be somebody that's contrary to the spirit of the body. I can't be somebody who's swimming against the flow of what the spirit is leading the body that I belong to in. And, and I guarantee you, we all love the Lord. There are churches everywhere. They love the Lord. They serve the Lord. They're doing their best to follow the Lord. They're great churches. Now, they may not have the same emphasis we do. They may not have the same flow we do. They may not do the same things we do. But their purpose is the same. They love the Lord. They want to see people's souls saved. They want salvation to come forth. And they want to be instruments of the kingdom of God. But if I'm not in the same mind of the particular family or body that I'm in, I need to find a body or a family that I am of that same mind. Because it doesn't, it doesn't prosper the kingdom of God for us to be divided over what God has called us to do. Some churches are wonderful with prayer. Some churches are wonderful with soul winning. Some churches are wonderful with mission work. Some churches are wonderful with Christian education. Uh, some churches are wonderful with children's ministry. Some have great nurseries. Some, you know, I mean, choirs, uh, bands, uh, uh, preachers. You know, there's all kinds of things that 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 are divisions about how God has called us to be ministered to. And what's vital and what we're to do and what part we're to play and how we fit in the family and whether they need our work, our ministry, whether we're an elbow in that body or a finger in this body or a big toe over here. I mean, good night. You know, God has lots, there are lots of things to consider. That's why God's called you to a body and called you to a pastor so that you can be led in what he, the way he wants you to go. Well, you got to be of the same mind. You can't be out here swinging on your own. Right. You are the problem. <laughs> Billy said, you're not going to be part of the solution. You're going to be part of the problem. I'm saying, you are the problem. You know the trouble with Bob, right? If everybody has trouble with Bob, Bob is the trouble. Right? Okay. Just so you know that. Third thing. I, I'm getting off course. All right. Let me, let me get, because I, I I've kind of gotten out of here. All right, third thing. And I urge all, you also, true companion, help those women who labored with me in the gospel with Clint and the rest of my uh, fellow workers who's, who's lamb, whose names are in the Lamb's Book of Life. What is that talking about? That's talking about service. 
It's talking about getting out and going to the mission field. It's talking about wading in some water and pulling somebody out of some muck. It's talking about getting your back down and pulling old wet carpet out and trying to help somebody rebuild their life. It's talking about, about reaching people, talking to people, serving people, looking for people that, that, that the gospel can reach, being a part of people's lives. Uh, adding your weight, showing up, singing loud, uh, you know, being involved in what's going on, serving the Lord. So if the peace of God is going to fill my life past my understanding, stand fast, be of the same mind, serve the Lord, get into the serving, not just the hearing part of it, serving the Lord. And then the third thing, or the fourth thing is rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. That's talking about the happiness and joy of my life, that I'm not some sourpuss that looked like I've been baptized in dill pickle juice and, you know, or persimmons or something like, you know, I've been eating persimmons all my life. I can't get happy and I can't raise my hand. I can't shout about the Lord. I can't get excited about things. I'm just a stick in the mud, you know? I'm contrary to the flow, man. I'm a rock in the stream. The whole thing has to go around me. I mean, when we get in here, the joy, the happiness, the rejoicing, the Spirit of God. You know what the difference between today and last Sunday is as far as the Spirit in this place? A bunch of you in here today are rejoicing. A bunch of you in here today are uninhibited. Yeah, yeah. I don't know whether somebody was here last Sunday that you didn't want to see you, you know, get happy about anything. But, man, for some reason, I mean, you can feel this. You can sense this. And when this praise team gets up here and they hit those first chords and you're sitting out there going, boy, that ain't helping a bit. That's not rejoicing. Man, when you jump up and they hit that first chord and you go, oh, man, come on, here we go, here we go, here we go. Then that's rejoicing in the Lord. And that makes everything go boom. And it encourages spirits and hearts and it draws out these old crabby, uh, ungodly things out of us that just want to suck us down and hold us down and keep us down and weight it down. And when you walk out the door, you say, whew, I'm glad I was at church today. That's what I needed. Yeah. That's rejoicing in the Lord. So you see, what I, you see what's happening here. And the peace of God. And the peace of God, yeah, you stand fast in the Lord, you get of the same mind, you start serving instead of just sitting, and you get happy about what God's doing in your life, you're fixing to have a reward here in just a couple of verses from now, and then look at the next verses. But be careful for no thing. In other words, don't be full of care for stuff in your life. You get full of care for stuff in your life, then when your stuff gets stuffed, you, you, you're, you're blown up. Don't let your life be controlled by what you want next, by the next thing that you think is going to make you happy. Don't get anxious. Being careful means, being full of care means, quit being anxious about stuff. Quit fretting over stuff. Quit worrying, having anxiety over stuff. That, that's just stuff in your life, man. Don't you realize God is in control of all of this stuff? And, and, and so you quit worrying about it. How about it, okay? I mean, because when you worry about it, you know what you're saying? God, I, I don't really trust you enough to be in charge of this stuff. And I think if I worry about it, it's going to make it better. Yeah, yeah. Tying his hand. Mark, you can't get into helping now, son. You got to get out. It's only the bees, not you. I, you know I'm kidding, brother. I love you. I love you. Boy, these, I tell you, Mark and Mike have come so far, boy. Mm. I love the boys. All right. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, yeah. which means, all right, let me just sum up this verse because I'm going to really preach. I'm, I'm, I'm not really into preaching right now. I'm, I'm just, oh, yeah. this is just, this is just the invitation. I mean, not the, uh, this is, this is just, <laughs> it's just the invitation. This is just, it's just the beginning here. This is, I'm just trying to get you encouraged. But anyway, here we go. Be careful for nothing, but all right, all right, all right. Uh, let's think about it this, this way. All right. Don't worry about anything. Pray about all things and praise God for everything. Don't worry about anything. Pray about all things and, and, and praise him in everything. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, you do those things right there, 
You stand fast. You be of the same mind. You get your service going right. You get happy about the Lord being in your life instead of all bummed out about all these kind of things. You, you, you pray about everything. You don't worry about anything. And you praise God for, for all things. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. When you face something with all of those things active in your life, it's going to be a speed bump on the interstate out there. Because the peace of God is just going to overwhelm whatever situation the enemy throws at you. That's what, that's what those verses are about. And then I didn't read the last one, but let me read the last verse. Think about the right things. Look at it, verse 8. Finally, my brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue in it, if there's anything praiseworthy about it, think on these things. Think on these things. You want to change who you are, you got to change the way you think. Hello. Think on these things. All right, now, let me give them to you in points. All right. Worry about nothing. Worry about no thing. Verse, all right, write that down. All right, it, the, I gave you four stress busters, right? That's what's on your outline. It says, uh, the apostle Paul, uh, can I really live a life of peace? Can I really live a life of joy? That was the question. Can I really, can that really be true? And to that, the apostle Paul says, yes, you can. And he says, let me give you four stress busters that you can have in your life that will allow you to live a life at peace and joyfully. So these are the four. If, if you're going to be at peace and joyful, you're going to, stress has got to go. Yeah, right. Stress is going to kill you now. I mean, stress is what robs you. So if you're going to be able to do this, you've got to get the stress out of your life. So what does Paul say in these eight verses that will help us get the stress out of our life? Now, see, that's what hermeneutics ought to be. That's what, that's what it is. I've always wondered whenever preachers are up waxing well eloquent about all this stuff, that somebody in the congregation would be saying to themselves, I've heard all that stuff. I, I don't need any more instruction on what I need to be. What I want to know is how do I do that? How do I do that? And so that's what my, I've always tried to do. I don't know if it always works, but I'm, if you hear me preach any message, you'd be listening for how am I going to do this? That's what you got. All right, so how are you? Here you are. Number one, worry about nothing. Now, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about it because I know when I put that up on the screen, you said, all right, I'm not supposed to worry about anything because verse 6, and I'm just put him up here with a line under it so you can see that I've already said that. Be careful for nothing. Be full of care for no thing. And so it's saying don't worry, don't fret, don't be anxious. And so you're saying, okay, great, got it, let's move on. Wait, hold on a second. Hold on one second before we move on. Right, not so fast, my friend. <laughs> Football's back on, thank the Lord. Life returns again to American society. Uh, Lee Corso, not so fast, my friend. If you've never watched uh, Game Day, you don't even know who I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. Not so fast, yeah. my friend. Yeah, uh, worry, worry. Mm -hmm. Worry is so easy to do. It's natural for us, right? I mean, humans just naturally worry about stuff. I, I'll give you an example. Uh, I, I go, I, my secular job is, is in New Orleans. Of course, it's all over Louisiana, Mississippi, but I got to go to New Orleans almost every day and back, 75 miles. Well, you know that in many days I encounter, I encounter uh, uh, the boogeyman, uh, highway patrol uh, law. Yeah, I encounter them, you know this, because you can't go down I-10, you know, and not encounter blue lights. Well, of course, I'm driving a company vehicle, and I can't speed, so I'm always driving the speed limit, obviously, right? Everybody say, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a holy man of God. I obey the law. I drive the speed limit. Well, anyway, so invariably, there are times when I'm moving on down the road, and everybody else is moving on down the road and all that. And all of a sudden, blue lights start flashing. Uh, well, I'm, I'm thinking, I don't know. I'm, blue lights are flashing. And what's the first thing that happens to me? All right, my heart rate goes up. My blood pressure goes up. My hands grip the steering wheel a little tighter. 
and, and, and it begins to, and I slow down always. And I start thinking about all the excuses I can give this guy <laughs> as to why I might have been going a little faster, maybe a little faster than I was supposed to. And, and then all of a sudden, and I kind of move over and all of a sudden, shoom, he goes right by. He's not after me. And I go, now, my question is, why do we do that? My question is, why do we live life expecting the worst? Right? Yeah, yeah. Those lights behind me, he's after me. Ah! Why, why is that the first thought in my mind? Because worry is so easy for humanity that we live life, many of us, how many of you ever heard anybody expre express the, the, the philosophy of life, uh, expect the worst and you'll never be disappointed? Have you ever heard anybody say that? Well, that's their philosophy of life. Their philosophy of life is, look, in every situation, just expect the worst. And then when the worst happens, you won't be disappointed. Now, that's a life of worry. That's what worry is. Expecting the worst. That's why I put in your notes, if you didn't pick up the notes, you don't have this information, so I'm going to read it to you. But if you did pick up the notes, look at it in the first point there. I put the thing. It said in 2006, listen to this. In 2006, Dr. Walter Cavert did a study of things that we worry about. He discovered, listen to this, he discovered that 40% of the things we worry about never happen. So almost 50% of the stuff you're expecting the worst on never even happens. So you're worrying about something that's not even going to happen. All right, listen to it. 30% of our worries are concerns about the past. Now, can you do anything about the past? No, negatory. So now we're at 70% of the things you worry about, seven out of 10 things that pop into that beady mind of yours to say, to say, I need to really be worried about this, are never going to happen or you can't do anything about. No, it's not finished, all right? Listen to this. 12% are needless worries about our health. We're afraid we're sick or whatever, and we're not. And 10% are insignificant or petty, they don't really mount to much, but we worry anyway about them. Eight, so that leaves 8% are legitimate issues. And you might ask, what is a legitimate issue? Well, it's what that hypochondriac put on his tombstone. I told you I was sick. All right. <laughs> so in other words, over, oh, in other words, 92% of our worry is over things that won't happen or things we can't change. In order, I put it on here, it's a, in, uh, in order to reduce stress, live one day at a time. Hello? In order to reduce, you say, how can I worry about nothing? Live one day day at a time. One day, not tomorrow, not yesterday, but today. Now, that is a great philosophy of life. What it says to you is, if you can take one day at a time you will not be living a life that God never intended for you to live. And you will not be taking responsibility for something that God never authorized you to take responsibility for. God says, these days that we live in are my days. You know what worry is? It's an attempt to control things. Like, if I worry about them enough, I can make them change. In other words, we're playing God. We're, we're saying, God, you obviously are not doing a good enough job at this. You obviously aren't paying attention. So I'm, gonna, I'm worried about this because I don't think you're paying attention. I don't think this is on your radar screen. And, I, and, and, and somebody needs to do something about this because this is going to be a real big problem. But I'm telling you that worry is useless. Because worry can't change anything. 
Worry's not going to make something be different. Worry's like rocking in a rocking chair. Plenty of activity, no progress. Yeah. You still have the same issue when you quit worrying about it as you did when you started worrying about it because worry is not going to change anyway. You know what Jesus said in Matthew 6? This is in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 are all the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus preached to 5,000 people out there. Tell them how to enjoy. They start with the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall be the king. All right. In, that, in chapter 6 of that, he says, look, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will take care of itself. Tomorrow will have enough worries on its own. Don't worry about tomorrow. Do you know what Jesus was saying to us? Jesus was saying to us, don't put your umbrella up until it starts raining. Simply. Don't start worrying about tomorrow's rain and pop that umbrella up today. Wait until it starts raining to put the thing up because tomorrow will take care of itself. And just remember this, that today is the tomorrow that you worried about yesterday. Today is the tomorrow that you worried about yesterday. Live one day at a time. Worry about nothing. Bust up the stress in your life. One day, that's it. This is the only day we have to worry about. Tomorrow, God's going to give us the ability to handle that. So let's worry about day. Number two, number two. Pray about everything. Now, in, in this little concept, I want to just share with you the, the, the notice here. And you'll notice what he says. He says, I want you to pray about everything, not just spiritual things. I want you to pray about everything. By, he says, by prayer and supplication, let your request be known to God. You know what supplication is? A petition. That's your gimme, gimme, gimme in Jesus' name. That's what we're professionals at, right? When we go to the Lord in prayer, right? I mean, think about the way you pray. Think about what you pray. And I know you say lots of magical words and you say lots of, you know, wonderfully poetic things to God. But it really boils down, if you just took out the list and you really boil it down, no matter what the filler is with all the magic words, the point is gimme, 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 Give me, give me, in Jesus' name. What this verse is saying is, everything in our life, no matter how insignificant it seems, if it's big enough for us to worry about, it's big enough for us to pray about. If we are concerned about it, God is concerned about it. Nothing is too big for God to handle or too small for God to care about. He cares about us. And so don't just think that we've got to talk to God about spiritual things. He says pray about pray in everything in life. And, and what will happen is if you find yourself praying instead of worrying, which, by the way, this is just kind of like one of those little hermeneutical points, Wesley. This is, uh, every time God takes something out of our life, he always puts something back in. Amen. So when he says, when he takes the negative away, he puts positive back in. He says, don't worry about anything. Quit doing that. You're wasting your time. Take worry out of your life. And then he says, and add in praying about everything. So what would happen if we stopped worrying about all this stuff and started praying about it? Mm -hmm. You know what would happen? We would have a lot more free time and a lot less to worry about. Because he says, I, and he says take your list, take your petition by prayer. Oh, well, uh, I didn't put the verse up. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's in my mind. All right. But in everything by prayer and supplication. By, by, by prayer and making your petition. Write down your stuff that you're 
concerned about. I mean, know what it is. And this is why I'm saying this, because some people pray such general prayers, they wouldn't know if God answered it if he did. I mean, like this, God bless me, God bless me. What does that even mean, God bless me? I mean, what is that? I mean, you end up in the hospital, uh, because you're too big for your britches and you need to be brought down to your size and you need to have a, a, a place to think about things without, without flying away? Or would that be a blessing? Well, I mean, what you just prayed, God bless me. Well, what does that even mean for God to bless you? And how would you ever know if he did it or not? I'm just saying, get specific. I'm just saying, pray about stuff that you will notice when God begins to answer these things. Yeah, man. I mean, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, count your many blessings. Right. Name them one by one. How does that sound? When, when upon life's billows you are tempest tossed. You didn't know you were going to hear a hymn today, did you? When you are discouraged, thinking all is lost. Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Yeah, so amid the conflicts, whether great or small. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Y'all need a little relief from all this hammering I'm doing on you. There you go. There's always something to be, to be thankful for. Thank God for everything. All right, give me, let me give this other one. Gosh, it's time to go, go, go. Thank God in all things. Thank God in all things. Notice, I know y'all can figure that out to write it down, but notice right here. You see, I circled a little word. Be careful for nothing but in everything. Now, you might think I'm straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel, but... In is different than for, right? It does not say praise God for everything because everything that happens is not, is not good, right? I mean, come on. Some of that stuff that happens in your life is not good and it's painful and it's hurtful and it is intended by the enemy to destroy you. It's intended by the enemy to knock you off track and mess you up and convince you God doesn't love you and he doesn't care about you and you need to leave God. That's... You know, I mean, he's messing you up. He's trying to mess with you. Yeah. So it doesn't say praise God for everything. It says praise God in everything. You know why you can praise God in everything? Because in the book of Romans, Paul says, for we know that all things work for the good of those who are called by God or those who are loved and called to his service. In other words, God's going to take whatever the enemy intends to be bad and he's going to somehow work it with a bunch of other stuff and it ends up being good for you. Now, how many of you have ever seen that happen in your life? How many of you have ever said when something happened in your life, oh my Lord, that's the worst thing that ever happened in the world? I've done it several times. And then lo and behold, a few months later, a few months later, when God worked it with some other stuff that I didn't even know was on the horizon, it did not end up being the worst thing that ever happened in my life or the major catastrophe that ended me. It ended up being a tremendous blessing to me that I would give my life for. And I'm just saying, we don't know. So when stuff happens, praise God that whatever it is, look, if, it, if it's something that's terrible and it's killing you and that, God's going to take it away. If, 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 it, if it's something that, that he's not going to take away, he's going to give you the grace to live with it. Yeah, say it, Pastor, say it. Now, may I say that to you again? Because there's a lot of torment and torture in life with us going, why can't he be the same? Why can't he be the same? Why can't he be the same? Yeah. Oh, I don't want to do something terrible. We got some little something, you know, some little zit that pops up on our head or something. We, we thinking this is the end of the world and we got to go to the wedding and oh my Lord, and can't put enough makeup on it to cover it up. And, and, and then you're just all the way to the wedding. You're saying, why can't it? Why couldn't it be like it was yesterday? Why couldn't it be like it was yesterday? You just torture yourself like that's the end of the world. And I'm just telling you, God's going to either take that away or he's going to give you the grace to live with that thing. How about that? And so you can relax about it because I'm just telling you that 
in a little while, it's not going to matter to you, all right? Everything is not crisis, and and life's not going to always be like this. Man, people do want to do crazy stuff because they, they think their life's over, and if they wait five minutes, man, life would be different. I'm just saying, don't beat yourself up and torture yourself with stuff that, that, that's going to change five minutes from now. I mean, my Lord. And he says, all right, so here we go. Praise God. Be thankful in everything. I wrote in your outline, I found a quote out of Purpose Driven Life. I really found the information, and then I, I found it came out of uh, Purpose Driven Life, or it was written in there, so I just uh, stole that and put it in your outline. Let me, just, let me just read it to you, all right? Here it is. The healthiest human emotion is not love. Again, the healthiest human emotion is not love, but gratitude, being thankful. It actually increases our immunities. It makes you more resistant to stress and less susceptible to illness. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? People who are grateful are happy, but people who are ungrateful are miserable because nothing makes them happy. They're never satisfied. It's never good enough. So if you cultivate the attitude of gratitude, of being thankful in everything, it reduces stress in your life. That's why I'm saying, thank God in all things. Let me read, let me read one other thing up here, and then I'm going to quit. I'm going to give you the last one, but, but let me just... I, I saw it when I was reading this one, and it's so good. I want you to, I want you to hear this about praying about everything and quit worrying and start praying because you've got plenty of time then and you don't have a lot to, work, a lot to pray about, a lot to worry about. Research conducted partly at the University of Colorado at Boulder, this is in your notes on number two, has found that regular churchgoers, how many of you are regular churchgoers? Let me see. Okay. All right. Found that regular, wait, those seats didn't raise their hand. Okay. All right. <laughs> Colorado at Boulder has found that regular churchgoers live longer than people who seldom or never attend worship services. Right? A glory. For the first time, that extra lifespan has been quantified. In other words, somebody's done studies and they put numbers to this thing and they can tell you how it blesses you by a number, okay? While there are differences between genders and races... By the way, women live longer because of this, and, and other races that are not Caucasian, European, live longer. So it's better for minority races, it's better for women than it is for us old ugly white guys. Uh, <laughs> but while there are differences between genders and races, in general, in general, those who go to church once or more each week can look forward to about seven more years of life than those who never attend. See, you are extending your life by being here today. And uh, you're, you're welcome. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. People who attend church every Sunday are more likely to pray than to worry. That's why they live seven years longer. They're more likely to pray than to worry. That's what stress does to you what it's boiling down to. Okay, so we're praying, we're thanking God for everything. Let me give you just one little last thing, and I, I promise, think about the right things, and, and this is finding my brethren things that are true, noble, just, pure, good report, lovely, praiseworthy, virtuous. If you'll notice, there are eight filters there. God said, I'm gonna give you eight filters to run the things you think about through, so make sure they can go through these eight filters. Now, here, here, here's, here's what's going on with this. In order to reduce stress, I have to think differently because most of us think stressfully. And what's the, what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results? That's insanity. So in order to reduce stress, we have to Think less stressfully. So what does that mean? Well, think about the way you think right now. Think about the normal flow of, of your thinking. You get up in the morning, right? Flip on Bad News America. 
All right. Then you drink your cup of coffee and you look at that uh, miniature control device that pops up with all the news that you've missed during the night. And it tells you that that loon over in North Korea has shot another missile off. It tells you that there have been four anti-American God-hating rallies going on. Uh, while you were asleep. It tells you that there have been two more murders, five more rapes. Uh, some buildings have been burned down. There's been a tornado, hurricane, flood. There've been, and, then, and then just in case you didn't really get enough with your little coffee, when you get in your car, you turn your radio on and the news is on your radio in your car. And, and they're going to tell you more stuff like that that happened. And then when you, then you live all day and you go through all the job and all of that kind of stuff and you get home and at night you say to yourself, you say, man, you know, I need to relax. I'm going to turn on the movie of the week and turn on the movie of the week and it's about the revenge of an axe murderer. <laughs> and, and, then, and then you start the next day. Now, all I'm saying is, it's no wonder, it's no wonder we think the way we think. If that's what we fill ourselves up with, that's what we're going to be thinking about. And in order to think about something different, we're going to have to put different things in. That's right, that's right. And I've already told you, if you would quit watching the news, your life would be happier right now. Absolutely. Right now. I mean all of them. Just quit all of them. I'll tell you what you need to know. How about that? That would be, you know, we already probably called a cult, so that probably would add to it right there. No, I'm not going to tell you because I'm not watching it either. Because I have found I'm much happier when I don't. I used to just, I used to just have the news on in my house all the time. I found I've been much happier without it. Because, yeah, I, no, man, I don't. <laughs> I don't know how to get it, but, um, yeah, some people do. They get the little notices. But, anyway, my point is... These filters right here, you see these? Those are filters. If it doesn't fit through those filters right there, then it says, God says, don't be thinking about it. And so if you tell me, you say, Pastor, I don't like who I am. I don't like what I'm becoming. Then I'm going to say to you, change what you're thinking. If you want to be different, change the way you think. You want to act differently, change the way you think. The way you think makes you feel like you feel, and the way you feel makes you act like you act. Yeah, yeah. So if you want to change the way you act, change the way you think, not the way you feel. Mm -hmm. What you think about affects your life, and God knows that, and that's why he says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true and whatever things are noble and whatever things are just, if it's pure, if it's lovely, if, it, if it's good, if it's good, that right there would, that, that one filter right there would kill about 99% of what comes in our life. Yep, yep. That one single filter. Uh, it's, if it's good, if it's any virtue in it, if there's anything to praise God about, think about those things. That's what you can think about. All right. So. <music>